Hello, and welcome to World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr, and we're coming to you from Film Scene in downtown Iowa City. This is part two of a three-part series called The Tenacious Cycle of Poverty, Hunger, and Disease. In this segment, we'll consider how poverty and disease go hand in hand among the poorest of the poor in Brazil, the home of our 2014 International Impact Award winner, Dr. Selma Geronimo. Dr. Geronimo's colleague and collaborator at the University of Iowa has joined us as well. She's Dr. Mary Wilson, Professor of Global Health in the Departments of Internal Medicine and Microbiology at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. So thank you, Selma and Mary, for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And congratulations on receiving the International Impact Award. I'm sure it's very well deserved, and we're happy to have you here. It's, it's an honor, actually. I think it's a great responsibility because I, I'm this five feet tall girl, and I said, my goodness. Uh, so I actually have to deliver what I heard <laughs> you talking about. Uh, so thank you, the University of Iowa. My institution is very thrilled in myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, so uh, Selma is the founding director of a new institute for tropical medicine. Uh, which is currently being built in Natal, Brazil, and uh, she's also a professor at the major state university of the state of Rio Grande do Norte, <laughs> and uh, the institute is part of that university. So um, I'd like to just begin by having you tell us a little bit about yourself. What was your background when you grew up? Uh, yeah, I, um, I was born in a small town, uh, I think very typical, like Iowa, 4,000 people. And uh, I left the town when I was seven years old and moved to Natal. And that's where I got all my schooling. And uh, I was very moved when I was in high school with biology. So I want to persevere in terms of biology and understand a little bit of genetics. Uh, but then medicine sort of got in the way, and uh, I ended up uh, going to medical school. And uh, uh, after I finished medical school, I came to U.S. and I was introduced to Leishmania. I mean, it's kind of ironic that... Coming from Brazil, where you have leishmaniasis, I end up learning leishmaniasis in, uh, in the United States in the same laboratory that Dr. Wilson had been trained. Um, and when I went back to Brazil, there was an outbreak of leishmaniasis. And that's when we sort of uh, start working on, towards understanding what was going on. And basically, I think it was sort of the turn of Brazil of becoming a very urbanized country. And, and then a lot of the people who lived in rural areas moved to the major cities, but they moved without the proper environment to live. And then, and then it's the cycle that you discussed before of poverty, but now poverty in urban areas. And you create a, a whole layer of problems, not only of disease, but of violence. And then that's when uh, drugs came in. So I think it's just get a complex situation and I think uh, we see a lot with the work we'll be doing, the young children that have the disease uh, we are studying also getting being trapped in the cycle of, of the drug uh, involvement and everything else. So I think it's, this led us to actually start working not only into the health issues, but also the educational issues. I think that's probably the greatest task that we have because education is the only way that you can free people from the, the poverty uh, that they live on. Mm -hmm. It's like not only the, the environment, but also uh, in, in, the, in the mind. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about these tropical diseases you work with. You've mentioned lesh leishmaniasis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so leishmaniasis was the first one, and we started really uh, with a small lab. Uh, we had hardly anything. Dr. Wilson, when she first went to Brazil, Dr. Donas, I don't know whether John is here, but uh, yeah, he, we had nothing. So we, with some grants from NIH and later from grants from uh, the Brazilian Council, we were able to set up a lab that enabled us to study. But once you start one disease, then it's almost, you go to those households, to the field, and you see leishmaniasis, but they only, they, they just don't have leishmaniasis. They have other diseases. They have like we sort of we start to face leprosy, they have GI, uh, 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 gastrointestinal diseases, they have uh, hypertension, they have preeclampsia. So you just start to unravel a lot of other diseases, and that's you sort of try to get people who are specialists on this to group and actually address because it's not that a person has one single disease, it has multiple diseases. So that's how the institute was kind of drawn up. Um, was to have a, a place, uh, and it's still an idea on the construction in which we could 
uh, do all the uh, studies that we want, but also do the proper, proper medical care with having people with different backgrounds that are able to address uh, properly. And Brazil is getting a lot of press these days. It's not only because of the election, but also be because of the economical growth that it went. But also, it's a country that has its complexity in terms of, uh, of the level of education differences. And I think that's probably our big, uh, biggest bottleneck is actually how we're going to move those people uh, that at this time that do not have enough education to actually solve their own problems. So I, I think in some ways bringing in all new ideas in which we, we are able to actually make people uh, more, uh, more uh, aware, more empowered uh, to actually it's help solve their own problems because the state will never be enough to actually solve all the problems. So I think it's, it's a little bit on, on this. So I think that's the idea that we have is that uh, coupling the study of disease, but to be able to free people from the disease, you also you ought to have education associated with that. Yeah. And I understand access to medical care is also really critical for these many of the people you study and you work with. I know that you you offer free medical care to the people that you are working with in these poverty-stricken areas and. And uh, some of Mary's students, and Mary herself also works there in this region. And uh, so access to doctors and sort of um, an understanding that, yes, there may be medicines that could help my child. I mean, this is. Uh, well, uh, if we look into, like, Brazil is like, it's incredible. In the last 30 years, has made, has, we have had so many changes. It's almost like you see uh, log scale things that, that's going on. Uh, the problem is uh, reaching the health unit. And once you have sort of uh, complex problems, get into the tertiary center, uh, which like in Brazil, you can get a bypass if you need. You can get a transplant if you need. But the problem is that some of the other things that kill people as well, sometimes it get lost in, 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 the, in, the, in between. So I think the idea is actually to create a culture that we can deliver medical care in a proper way uh, and in a faster way so that we, we don't uh, have the mortality that we have for some of these that could be avoidable. Right. Like leishmaniasis, uh, at the start of the outbreak, we had about, there was one particular year that we had 13% of the cases died. Now it's about 5, five to 6% of the cases and this happens because they come late. So uh, the idea is actually if we can catch some of those diseases earlier, you decrease uh, uh, the complications, the morbidity, and you decrease mortality. Do these tend to be diseases that children uh, uh, most readily get? Um, the leishmaniasis used to be a disease of children. It, it, actually, the name Infanto is because uh, but now it's, it's occurring in younger uh, adults. Uh, so a lot of the, GI, the uh, enteric diseases occur in children. And that's when you solve that, and when we decrease the enteric diseases, we actually uh, uh, increase the, uh, decrease the inf infant mortality. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's really in incredible when you look at the data, how has, uh, this has changed over the last 20 years. So Mary, let me bring you into the conversation. How did you and Selma begin to work together on these, these kinds of uh, disease problems? Well, um, Selma mentioned that we trained in the same lab at the University of, of, of Virginia with the same uh, mentor. And uh, uh, there was one time I actually met Selma at a, a summer conference, and she came up to me and introduced herself. And, and uh, she's got this wonderful, warm personality. So of course, immediately I, I took to her. But um, I, we both had, even though we were from such different backgrounds, we have sort of a common goal of really um, liking the research, being fascinated by it, but but also mostly just really caring about the people who have diseases that they shouldn't have that that Selma was mentioning because they're 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 curable and treatable, and so um, so I, I it was in 1996 when Selma first invited me down to Brazil, and uh, I went down there and saw her lab that had three pipettes in it. Um, and, and a urine spinner, it had that too. <laughs> um, and um, then went out with her to see some of the families and, and, um, and just was really inspired by Selma's ability to work with the populations um, and also really, really struck by, by the stark difference between even, you know, the, the, what was then a small, very small middle class in Brazil and, 
and these uh, houses where, where there, there was just very little access to anything. And I remember we, we examined the first house was a house with two, two children who had had leishmaniasis. And, and there were 16 people living in a three-room house. And we spent, you know, we've been trained medically and we're used to spending an hour or so with, it, with every patient. We probably spent 10 minutes per person just examining them. I examined them, some had talked to them because my Portuguese is not very good. But, um, but afterwards they told us that, they, that we'd spent, given them more attention than any physician they'd ever met in their lives. And it's just, it's just really sad. Well, so now you, for many years, have gone to Brazil and you've also taken students or sent students to work with Selma in her region. Uh, what is the effect on, on these uh, global health and public health uh, doctors who, who go there as you have? Um, well, um, I, th I think that for uh, a physician in training um, to go to a, a developing country or a situation, a, a developing situation where, where they observe poverty and observe what it's like to have poor access to medical care is really an important thing for our medical students and I wish every student could do it. I, I did as a fourth year student and came back to the US and had culture shock when I came back. It, and so um, it's really, I've, I've facilitated the students going down, um, I've, uh, I've uh, helped them get grants to fund their trips, but it's really Selma who's been welcoming and, and she'll, she'll take as many as she can possibly handle and, and she really does a good job getting them just out to see see what people are like and see the situation so they can really learn how much we have and how, how we really don't realize what we have. Right. So, when, uh, so when one of these students or one doctor comes to your area, um, they're looking at the issue of patient relationship, but they're also sort of assessing what the, what the overall health circumstances are. Is there clean water in this community? Uh, how much do people have to eat and all of these kinds of things? Um, um, what is your impression of yeah the work these, these uh, doctors do when they, when they come from a place like Iowa, where they've, many of them have lived in very different circumstances and, and, and you know, want to make a difference. What are the things that they take away as being most important? Um, I, I think it, it actually it's both ways because it's sort of, uh, I was very much influenced uh, by what I see here. And also when you see physicians like Dr. Wilson, um, Dr. McGowan, who's, who's there, and uh, others here, uh, who actually come from a very privileged society and decide to actually go through like this training and then decide to make a career out of, of those diseases. That it's just amazing that you leave the comfort and the protection that you have here, and you are you 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 are exposed, and you are in, a, in sometimes in vulnerable places. So actually, it, it's it sort of goes both ways. Yeah. Uh, showing that uh, what drives one to actually make the move, to make the change, that mm -hmm. it's needed to have a better world, the world mm -hmm. that I think uh, everyone deserves. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, if I have all the privilege, my life is okay, why bother to actually work uh, and get into trouble and uh, face difficult situations? Mm -hmm. So I think it actually inspires the other side, uh, and I think uh, we have profited a lot uh, from seeing uh, some of the students and physicians who came to our place uh, as much as they see uh, the abundance uh, of wealth that uh, they have in their own country in the United States compared to some of the places that Mary, that Dr. Wilson mentioned in terms of a, a, a house with three rooms where over 12 people live. Mm -hmm. um, Lucky Brazil is warm so you can you spend most of the time outside, but you have to go uh, at night sure. to, the, to the same place. So I think it, it goes both way, and it's just like seeing how lucky coming from the U.S. and the opportunities, and then make a choice in terms of the career you want. Mm -hmm. And also the complexity, uh, because like w when we are in medical school, we usually go one problem at a time, and then when you are in the real world, then you have the complexity of several diseases at the same time. So I think it actually, your thinking gets sharper. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good uh, way of seeing diseases and see the complexity of the environment that influences some of the diseases. The disease that we are, that it's either vector-borne or it's transmitted by uh, different uh, ways, uh, but also uh, the economical mm -hmm. side of, 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 the, of the problem. 
when we were communicating before this program today, um, you mentioned, I believe, Mary, that one of the inspirations for beginning this Institute for Tropical Medicine was uh, being faced with leprosy, a disease that I think many of us would think had been wiped out a long time ago. I think many of us think of it as some kind of ancient disease that doesn't even exist anymore. But it is, in fact, treatable, and yet many people in Brazil yeah. have contracted leprosy. I think leprosy is an example of, uh, it's almost, it's, there is a, almost a symbolism to, to, to mm -hmm. the disease. Uh, it's a, uh, you've seen in the Bible, and uh, even myself coming from an area, like c coming from Brazil, I, uh, I saw two cases of leprosy during medical school, and it's something I say, oh, this doesn't exist. And when uh, Mary and I were looking for another, dis another disease caused by a pathogen that sort of lives in the same cell that the Ishmania, I sort of started looking more carefully and found this wonderful physician, uh, Dr. Mauricio, who's, been, who's the person who actually put together all the information that we had for leprosy in my state. And then we start to, to see that there's really a problem. And uh, I think what drove us to actually try to work to a, to a better place was seeing someone like a young 30s coming into the clinic in a wheelchair because of leprosy. And when you see that, I mean, that person uh, is in a wheelchair for his life. Uh, the medication, it was just next room. And if he had had it 10 years before, it would be as normal as, uh, as we are. So it's just the unfairness of, and I think the complexity of, of, of treating disease because you have the proper medication, you have the availability of the medication, and then it's delivering and having people actually take the medication time-wise. So I think it just shows, and, and this is kind of interesting for the medical students, that uh, sometimes we think that we're going to save everyone, but it's the complexity of when you treat health. Is, uh, is You think about the chemists that de uh, develop all the medications or the biologists and everything, but it's not only having in the shelf, but actually the act of delivering mm -hmm. and having sure that the patient will have adherence to the treatment. And leprosy, uh, in the complications of leprosy, it brings in the science, but also brings in the, the human behind the disease that is just unacceptable. So it's one of the things that, uh, so a few months ago, I, I, I went uh, to with the president of my university to the Minister of Health. We're trying to get the funding to get all this stuff done. And he said, but you guys are putting an institute to actually uh, that you're supposed to eliminate all those diseases. Yeah, we're going to eliminate those diseases. That's going to be our task for the next, but it's going to be 20 years, mm -hmm. and that's when I'm, I'm about to retire. So I, I, we need to get it done the next couple of years so that yeah. we, can, we can work towards eliminating. But I think it's just, it, you control initially, and then you think of eliminating. And I think it's feasible if we actually, and we have the human power to actually uh, control and eliminate. And, and, and I, I either, I mean, uh, Brazil is the second country in the world that has more cases, and it doesn't go well. The seventh world economy having a disease that, so it, I think it's those things are unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, so I think uh, the major, one of the major reasons that I think it's kind of give us energy to move on is actually that we find this unacceptable. Mary, you have um, gotten any number of grants, uh, research grants, uh, with Selma to work on many of these tropical diseases. How did you get interested in tropical diseases? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, um, I was always fascinated with Africa. Mm -hmm. And when I was, uh, uh, went to medical school, I really wanted to do a, a rotation in Africa. And uh, I thought at that point I was going to be a medical missionary. Um, and I, I uh, uh, arranged to do a two-month rotation in Sierra Leone, of, of all places. And so I went there um, and worked with, uh, uh, at Kamakui Medical Center for two months and was, was just really appalled by, by what Selma was talking about, the fact that there, that there are preventable diseases, treatable diseases that were, really, um, that were, that were not coming to the world attention and that, that really were not being cared for. And so it's the same thing the last speaker was talking about. You, you see these things and, and you can't forget them. And so, um, so it was for that reason that I really became interested in parasitic diseases and tropical diseases mm -hmm. and then was able to meet some inspiring people like Selma along the way that kept me going on it. 
Well, of course, everyone in this room, all of us know that Sierra Leone has been very much in the news, that health professionals who are trying desperately, from coming from many parts of the world, trying to help people who are suffering uh, from Ebola, this horrible disease. Um, I'd just like to ask for your reactions with some of the public discussion that's gone on about, I, I don't want you to give us particular advice on whether there should be quarantines or should it be 21 days or just, or just what, but, um, but what do you think when you, when you hear reactions, people um, who are so concerned that someone with Ebola may be treated here in a U.S. hospital, um, have, have you felt that the population just needs to be better educated about what the diseases actually are and what they can mean to an otherwise untouched population? Um, are you talking specifically about yeah. Ebola? Yeah, Ebola yeah. in this case. It's a good example of something that frightens many, many people and obviously needs to be addressed on a worldwide scale, but um, yeah. there's a lot of fear. Well, well it, it's, a, um, I mean, it, it's a big problem, and, and I'm certainly not the person that's the most expert in, and best to, to discuss it here, but, but I think that, um, that there's been a lot of press. I think there's, a, there's been a lot of effort to get a uniform approach, and I think that's very important. And so I think, um, I think rather than panic, just having a uniform approach, there has to be a lot of compliance with what the public health officials decide is important to do for prevention. And, and so I think that's, that's extremely important. But I also, also think it's important not to panic and just handle it mm -hmm. logically. Yeah. So what, what is next for you then, Selma? You go back. The institute is already up and off the ground? Um, we have the basic laboratories are up uh, and running. Mm -hmm. um, we, we now get the funds to get the outpatient clinic. Uh, and then that's, uh, we hope to break rounds in, uh, in December or January. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'm going to be doing like uh, an engineer check-in to see whether everything is done properly. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a lot of fun. I know everyone loves construction. And everyone knows, uh, but uh, we'll be doing that. But at the same time, I've been working with colleagues here at the uh, University of Iowa and colleagues back in Brazil to actually have a setup because it's not only building uh, the structure, but actually making it sustainable. And I think the sustainability is the, an important issue. And Brazil is going through a new, uh, very transitional phase in, in different aspects. And uh, so I think there are a lot of uh, economics changes uh, that should come soon. There is a unified health system that we have to uh, get the institute in, in that so that we can, we can have uh, healthy, sustainable uh, laboratories and sustaining clinics. So that's uh, the goal. But I think my number one is that I'm not going to retire before we have control of leprosy. That's, that's my, <laughs> in, in, in my state. I think that's, that's basically one of the things that I want to be yeah. very involved. Very good. Wow. Well, I can't thank you both enough for being here this afternoon. Dr. Selma Geronimo, uh, International Impact Award winner, and Mary Wilson, a doctor at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, and you nominated Dr. Geronimo, so thank you for that. And um, I hope all of you can join us for part three of this series where we're going to spend a little time on um, breaking the cycle of poverty, hunger, and disease. World Canvas programming is available on YouTube, iTunes, UITV, and the International Programs website, which is international.uiowa.edu. And if you'd like to investigate Film Scene, you can go to icfilmscene.org. I'm Joan Kerr. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.